we had seen the fall of the Berlin Wall a few years earlier. That was an important point for me. I was about 15 years old when that happened. And so that meant to me that the whole world political system of keeping people trapped behind barriers was over. That's what I thought at the time. And a lot of people thought that. It was kind of naive. But then the next thing that happened was I discovered the internet. And again, I naively thought the internet is the solution to all of our problems. It will put an end to war, and it will put an end to ignorance, and it will put an end to poverty. And, you know, the internet has accomplished a lot, but it hasn't put an end to war. Not yet. And then the next thing was when I was 19, when I discovered the science of David Shom, the ability to have money over the internet and private money over the internet. Either we're going to be moving towards a, a world in which people are you know, subjects, that all information about them and their activities and so on is known to others, or alternatively, people have control over their own information. And I thought, well, this is the third piece. If you have enough political freedom and you have communication, so you're no longer depending on governments or newspapers to control what you can read and write, then if you also have money, then all humans can help all other humans. And then that one never happened, right? The internet money didn't work. Instead, we got the credit card and banking money, which was centrally controlled, surveilled, and censored, and it's not global. that has fundamentally altered the course of money, of currency. We have the three components, medium of exchange, unit of account, and store value. Those have been around for millennia. And then something happened. In 1970, Richard Nixon signed the Bank Secrecy Act and turned money into a system of control that attempts to use money as a political tool in order to control who is able to send and receive it, and aims ultimately to the complete surveillance of all financial transactions worldwide. That's the whole point of blockchains. The whole point of this is to be able to take back control of your digital life, your data, your value, your money. This is a major game changer because it allows for revolutionizing most fields where, where it was taken for granted that trust in third parties or centralized institutions were simply a necessity. There's been many attempts uh, in this like peer-to-peer -peer decentralized movement since I think the 90s. There was a while when the internet first existed where you know, there was a race right, between centralized services and, and decentralized services. Over time, decentralized services lost out. The biggest reason there is that it's so much easier for a centralized service to create a like, good quality of service uh, because you have less technical hurdles to, to cross. Right? I'm the world record holder for having built the most distributed storage systems ever. I'd say, I guess it's four now. Um, the fourth one actually works, but the way we made it work was by sacrificing some of the hard 
parts, right? Like the economic incentive structure with the digital cash, which is why I got involved in Mojo Nation years earlier. Microcredit means that peers can establish relationships with other peers without having to necessarily trust them. We said we can't figure out how to make digital cash work well enough. We'll have to sacrifice it and come back to it. And then Bitcoin came out after that. Nobody really knows who invented Bitcoin. The Bitcoin white paper has been published in a mailing list on the internet by someone named Satoshi Nakamoto, which is a pseudonym. Satoshi discovered the breakthrough of how to have decentralized consensus, which is a thing that all experts previously believed was impossible. And we have good reason to believe, thanks to Sergio's, Sergio Dimian Lerner's research, that Satoshi mined a million of the early Bitcoins and never spent any of them. I had this, this moment in 2013 that I was with my computer in my home. I did some, some analysis and I found out that there were a lot of coins in the first year that belonged to some entity. And it, I suppose that was Satoshi. And so I published this. Uh, I didn't know what to expect. And uh, the, the thing that this, this entity had mined a lot of coins, and I hadn't sold any of that from all the, the bunch of coins he had. And we have the feeling of Satoshi from his writings, or from the way he interacted with other people. So Bitcoin was a revelation, but it was also completely outside the normal pattern of innovation. Initially, their reaction was that this is a dangerous thing. This is about the Silk Road, and this is about criminal activity. Yeah, I know what Bitcoin is, indeed. Bitcoin is a moeda virtual, tá bom? Como se fosse uma moeda da internet. But I'm not in favor of it. Uh, I believe it's quite dangerous because it's not in, uh, in a regulated environment. I discovered Bitcoin in 2011, and then I went down this rabbit hole for like two weeks, just reading up in the code base, trying to understand it trying to figure out how it works. It's still uh, pretty much all the, only the nerds who are, who are actually excited about it, I think. Um, the uh, the non nerds are, are probably more excited about the, the like a price growth, and uh, they just, like, a lot of people don't understand what's going on, but something is going on, like, okay. <laughs> you need to understand how consensus is achieved, roughly. You need to understand what this platform can do and what it's capable of. And you need to understand about the peer-to-peer -peer value exchange nature of the technology. As for, you know, details about hashes and all the rest, most people will never understand that, and nor will they need to. I've tried often to explain uh, to people who don't who know little about mathematics and software how mining works, how the blockchain works, and uh, but it, you need days for people to understand it. I mean, also, for me, it took weeks before I, I got it. There is no need anymore to explain to people the inner workings of the blockchain. I mean, if you learn how to drive a car, there's really no need to know how the piston engine works. It just works, right? You turn it on and you trust it. The automatic transmission made driving easier. And easier controls meant safer driving. What has changed is that back then everyone talked about Bitcoin and about cryptocurrencies. And the main focus was Bitcoin as a currency that wasn't a fiat currency controlled by a nation state. But the big change now is that everyone's talking about the underlying technology, the blockchain. Blockchain allows to you know, cut out so many layers in between, uh, layers that basically lived off just controlling certain points and you know, tapping into profit pools without necessarily contributing so much value. And all these layers can now be taken out by blockchain technology. It will hopefully erode a lot of the anachronistic or, or inefficient uh, centralized structures that, uh, that cause a lot of the problems and 
uh, delay innovation and, and creativity in the current world. Well, the biggest misconception is that this is about uh, currency. And currency is a terrific application for blockchains, and it's one of thousands. Vinay Gupta has been talking about the reason why we even need to, to build blockchains and other things. It's not for money. The main application is not money. Ultimately, we should be thinking about solving global problems. So if you had a, a global coordination system which allows everybody in the world to, to vote... So if you start putting the facts of the situation onto blockchains so that there is one truth that the entire world can see, it becomes imaginable that you could then have democratic decision-making at a global level. It's not a universal way of running the planet, but I think it's a really good fit for climate change, and I think it's a really good fit for a lot of the other environmental issues. I think the world is overwhelmingly against, for example, the release of genetically engineered organisms directly into the wild, and once it is clear that that's global public opinion, it becomes possible to punish the governments and the organizations which thwart the will of global democracy in the name of their own self-interest. I think there's a long road ahead, right? Like, we are at the very, very beginning of, of this whole decentralized movement. Thinking around use cases, sure, we can think of some now, but the potential for what this technology has to offer uh, is something that I'm not sure necessarily everyone's wrapped their heads around yet. I just want to see more people be able to do what they want to do, allowing people to not have to be stuck with the current sort of way we produce value in society. We can ensure that the creators of value, like musicians and scientists and artists and journalists, are fairly compensated for the wealth that they create. The good thing is, if you just look at the past three years, the difference between this year and the, the last year and the difference between last year and the year before is gigantic. But I, I think we, we do have some work to do. We're certainly not even really kind of close to the tip of the iceberg in terms of, you know, what, what we're going to see when blockchain becomes a more adopted mainstream reality. Bitcoin is sui generis. It's a mystery how Satoshi did it. But then the amazing thing is, Ethereum is another sui generis. We got really, really, really lucky twice. Lightning struck twice. When the technology first arose and when I first heard of Ethereum, I was immediately captured by the power behind it, this ability to completely democratize the space again. When we talk about we want to decentralize it, it's really we just want to get it back to the way it was supposed to be. 